All right, Anthony. Nice to have you, man. Thanks for uh, coming yeah. up and talking to me. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm really excited Cheers. to get to talk to you. And I don't know if I've told you before or if you've heard, but, you know, when I first, yeah, when I first started, my first ever, like, high-end Crested Gecko that got me into breeding, I got from you. So, um, how long, What year was that? Yeah, what's up? Mm, that was maybe like 2000, I want to say like 2007, 2006. So yeah, I'd been in maybe four or five years at that point, if that. But yeah, yeah. I remember you way, way back. I just, I, it's so hard to figure out like when you're looking back, like how long it's been. Yeah. But uh, I do remember... Uh, quite a few i think early on but yeah it's just crazy how time flies trying to get centered i know it, it's almost like after maybe like two years or three years it could be four five six years i don't know i can't tell how much I know. exactly how much time has i know i feel like i uh showed up at tinley a few years ago and then i heard a couple of years ago is what it feels like and it was actually four but it, yeah. you know, it just doesn't seem like it at all. But yeah, man, it's uh, kind of crazy what Cresteds of where they've gone, you know, where where they started. I know, man. I I never thought they would be this popular. I never thought they would be this big. But did you? I mean, I know you you worked with ball pythons before. I know you had the carpets, and and you've worked with a your you know a wide variety of different snakes and and reptiles. Did you ever see them? becoming this big and when did you know like they would be similar to like what happened with the ball pythons where there was a big boom did you ever see that coming yeah well with the genetics i have my doubts but um you know as far as genes and and high dollar stuff like that i mean you remember back in the day 500 was yeah. was pretty pretty high um yeah. so but really like yeah i mean and we still i still have some ball pythons we have jake and I have probably, I don't know, it's like a thousand snakes total. Yeah. Um, less than half of those are mine, but I mean, we still, you know, I'm still into that quite a bit. But the, to answer your question on the, the crested geckos, I thought they would be super popular almost as soon as I read an article about them, but I did not think they'd be taken this seriously, like in terms of genetics and things like that. I thought it was going to be more of a, high volume, low price, you know, kind of a, well, not low price, not like wholesale, but more like, kind of like carpet pythons were. Yeah. Um, back before Jaguars hit, you know, they were anywhere from a couple hundred bucks up to maybe seven, 800, you know, for nice ones. So it was, uh, but the selective breeding aspect, I think is what I, what I expected to be the whole thing. I didn't think I, I still have my, uh, what's the way to put this, but basically we have so many different phenotypes to start with. We don't really have a normal. I kind of thought this was going to be one of those things where it was just, you know, we might have, Sorry about we that. might have, all good. we might have genes, but they might be too hard to, to identify. Um, yeah. and prove out because we've got so many phenotypes but i think we're starting to see now some of these that are kind of they'll kind of transcend whatever you know the gene will lily white's a good example or super soft where it's kind of it's there no matter what color or pattern you put it on um but yeah i mean as far as numbers and popularity yeah i, I actually because of their care and because of the variation um, and the, the, you don't need a lot of equipment for them. I, I knew they'd be popular. I just, I didn't see $25,000 geckos. <laughs> yeah. You know, Me I neither. Thought that was, I thought that was a ball python thing, maybe some retics or something, but I didn't see these being like that. Now we're kind of, I, I love it. I mean, I, I love the genetics aspect of it before it was like, we could prove stuff out, but it really, 
it didn't make sense to track all those animals and keep track of what's a hit and what's not and all this stuff if they're worth 500 or a thousand bucks. Now that there's more potential, we can kind of get, I can get back into micromanaging some of my projects more, Yeah, which is what I'm doing. I started, I think last year I set up over a hundred group. No, I did 200 groups, but uh, probably 40 or 50 of them were tracking like very carefully. Um, that's how I started figuring some of this empty back stuff out. Did um, when you, you started, so you started back in 2004, right? Yeah, I think I got my first geckos maybe late 02 or early 2003. And then I picked up, I'm trying to remember when that show was. I think it was. It was when NARBC, when they had, it was before Tinley, they had Philadelphia. And it was at Philadelphia, I got my first gecko from uh, Alan Rapashi's table. And that was what, because I saw the structure, the color, the everything was just better on his stuff. And that's what really kicked me into high gear. And I think it was probably like 2004 when I really got serious. But I went full time that year. Oh, wow. So, I mean, I was, yeah, yeah. So, so at so that I mean, time, you were mostly selling to, like, reptile stores, specialty stores? Oh, or- no, I wasn't. I didn't produce any anywhere near. No, I had, like, oh, man, I think when I went full-time, I think I only had 60 or 80 geckos. I had some snakes, though, too, back then. Oh, okay. So that that's- I was making money off of. But, yeah, yeah, the Gateway, they closed the call center at the gateway uh, location I was working for the computers. Mm-hmm. Um, and they offered me a spot or a job. It's actually like paid double, which is still not enough to stay, but they wanted me to go to South Dakota. And I, I was like, nah, cause I, I have family here and all that. So I just figured I was going to do either that or websites. And uh, <laughs> the geckos were a lot more fun. Did you but, uh, uh, When, do you remember what, like, so when you first decided, okay, I'm going to do this full time, do you remember what the quantity size of the, uh, of the amount of, like the first breeding stock that you got, how many geckos was that, that you originally got? Oh, like from Alan, when I started buying from him or whatever, I think I was just buying 20 lots from him. I'd take about anything he would sell me numbers wise, but there weren't a lot available. Um. But yeah, he sent me some pretty cool stuff. And then, um, I don't know if you remember, I started listing some on his website for him. Was it his? I don't even remember. I might have been doing it on my website. But um, I think it was on your website. Well, the, yeah. But yeah, I sold his stuff for a while for him or helped him with it. And then, uh, yeah, man, I was pretty low volume, really, up until I remember like 2000. Nine, I produced like maybe 5,000 geckos. And I mean, I knew it was a lot, but I also knew it was a really bad number to be at because it was too big to do anything with them. Um, All retail, you can't retail 5,000 a year. And um, it wasn't even serious. You know what I'm saying? For like a whole, for a big distributor, they, what are they going to do with that? You know, a hundred a week or whatever. That's yeah. if I was selling them everything, which I would never do. So, yeah, I really didn't get into that until probably like 2012, 13, something like that. Uh, that's a high risk game, though, because, man, as soon as they stop selling, you start feeling yeah, exactly. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So your income goes down, your costs go up simultaneously. It's, yeah, it's bad. But most years, I would say, Probably six out of seven years are pretty good. And then about once every seven years, it hits the down cycle. That's where we're at right now. That's why prices yeah. have calmed down so much. They were like crazy high, though, for yeah. That's three what, years. Yeah, I was, I was talking to, to Brian Butler about that. And we were saying how, you know, like, like we just said earlier in this, you know, in this podcast, like there's $25,000 geckos. Some, I, I know even geckos that were sold for $50,000. Now, 
obviously that that was like super inflated at the peak of it but oh yeah that you know i think that definitely a lot of people got their hopes high and and korea was buying everything and asia was buying everything and now that they they're producing their own everybody's like oh wait what do i do with all these geckos and it's oh that was huge yeah man they were really pounding my door wanting stuff and anytime that happens you really have to uh be measured in what you do when you gear up you don't because if you've got you know it, it would be easy to think if i had 10 people contact me last week for 500 geckos well i could have sold 5,000 geckos last week no they were probably the if you had 10 people ask you for that they were probably for the same person maybe yeah. two people yeah that's true so yeah there's a lot of that going on everybody would promise me to be my best friend forever and buy geckos forever nobody buys geckos forever when they stop selling they stop buying that's just how it is so um yeah i i mean we all saw that writing on the wall when korea started buying up tons of geckos i mean they have the population of like one u.s state i think you know like yeah i think it's like 30 million people or something like that so i mean it's kind of like um you could see that one coming i mean then i don't know what happened or what was going on with all the do you remember all the hong kong guys wanting to buy stuff maybe a couple of years before that yeah i i think uh a lot of those geckos ended up in mainland china um at least oh that- yeah they were they were smuggling them as far as i know yeah Which, so i don't know if <laughs> what not down with that how they're, how they're doing that now but um i think that's oh, that. i hope they're not well yeah no people that get smuggling is <laughs> well yeah i mean i'm i'm always super careful about shipping i mean that's a big like that plays into a lot of um the ethics of it for me like if i'm going to be losing stuff i don't want to be doing it but anyway those guys it's uh one time i sent a big shipment over there of like a thousand i didn't know i didn't know what they were doing at the time but then when he came back and told me they lost like a quarter of them oh really I was flo- oh i was floored i was like what are you guys doing with them and he pretty much told me and it was like oh my god i shipped those two weeks ago and they still haven't been put in a cage like yeah you should have lost a quarter of them yeah um so yeah i don't oh, i'm not down with that whatever they're doing over there i don't want any part of it i've made it clear to them to any of those i've dealt with but yeah that i don't really i used to get several inquiries a week from hong kong buyers and i that that died out too yeah. i i know there are so, a, couple, a, a couple really good people in hong kong that just sell to everybody in hong kong I have a friend, uh, Michael, that he sells, he has a shop in Hong Kong and he has a bunch of really nice cresteds, gargoyles, leeches, you name it. And, and I seen, you know, on Instagram, you could see his, his store and everything. And it's really, well, they have a, that's a massive population. Um, and Hong Kong, if they're staying within Hong Kong, they're not getting smuggled anywhere because that's totally legal to, to ship, you know, to get them into Hong Kong. Um, but yeah man i mean that's a big i think people don't realize that's a big market getting into mainland china but i don't think that's on on the uh are gonna be you know gonna be something we're gonna see happen anytime soon uh have have you seen have you seen any other countries open up i know like recently i get a lot of inquiries from mexico mexico and um, I get people from South America always hit me up about it, but you know, obviously South America is really different. Yeah, laws are tight. Um, my my son's mother's Brazilian. We had looked into what it would take to set up shop down there just out of curiosity, because not really the financial part of it, but just like legality of it, it's totally uh-huh. not worth it. Not yeah. a, well, I don't know about impossible. You probably bribe somebody and get it done, but yeah. then you got to keep then you got to keep bribing them if they see you're making money. But um, uh, yeah, it doesn't sound like something you could just go and set up shop somewhere and do. Um, I don't know what the deal is with Mexico with the 
and it seems like they can't really import anything either, which is crazy. So I don't know. I I know. Um, I mean, we get a lot of imports from. What's his name? This guy. Yeah, we got we got imports from Me Mexico sometimes. But what's the guy's name that does oh. always evolving pythons? Do you know him? Who? The guy who does always evolving pythons. Oh, don't know. I forgot his name. Um, he's anyways. He he's Mexican and he has something going on with with Mexico where he could actually export to Mexico. Um, and as far as I know, everything's legal and everything, but he's been able to do that. Um, especially with all the ball pythons, there's a lot of like really good ball python and leopard gecko breeders in Mexico right now. And I know oh, a, I, lot, a lot of people have asked me about crested geckos down there too. Yeah. I mean, I get the inquiries. I just, as far as I know that we can't really, can't really sell them to them. Yeah. Um, I mean, imagine that though. That'd be a huge. That'd be a really good uh, market. That opened up. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, that's another huge. I mean, think about Mexico City. That's a huge. Um, what do you call it? Metropolitan area that would yeah. be big. God, I know we yeah. import like I think it's Leon. I forget the name of the state. The city is Leon, Mexico, but it's like the boot making capital of the world or something like that. And we import tons, tons of boots from them. Yeah. Uh, but even the hides, like getting hides in and out of Mexico. And, and I forget what the deal was. I was talking to a buddy of mine. It's a family friend has a, a store and they, he was telling me like, there's, he was asking me about reptile hides and I'm like, yeah, not the reptiles I do be some expensive boots. But, um, but we got to talking about it and he said, it's Mexico is just like really hard to deal with as far as like, if he wanted to source um, alligator hide and then send it to Mexico and have boots made and send it back, it was not a hmm. good way to do it it was easier to source the hide within mexico which was problematic in and of itself because they didn't have access to the same farms he did here uh but yeah i don't know i i i kind of wonder how long um as global trade gets bigger i mean shoot they're right right next door you know it'd be nice if we could do business there yeah yeah what the, um, I don't know what the population of Mexico is. It's got to be. It's bigger than South Korea. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's for sure. Um, so, Anthony, I, you know, over the years, you have been the one who, who, have, who has named a lot of these new moors that have come out with crested geckos, the phantoms. Not the my South favorite Korea. job. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I mean, it's, it's part of what you do, though, because you have such a massive collection and you've you know, you got to talk about it. Yeah. You've coined so many different things. Um, the empty bags, obviously. Now, when somebody else actually said empty back, but it was, they were pretty much all coming, or I don't know about all, but a lot of them coming out of my stuff. Yeah. So, well, so Butler said that he, he was originally the one who first coined that name empty back. I think but, so. Yeah. But, but he got his, they were originally super stripes and he got his super stripe collection from you directly from you. He said, so directly, directly, like he was on premises. Yeah. Yeah. He and said. somehow managed to talk me into selling him one, but yeah, he's exactly right. So God, and that so, was, that's like buying when you first discover the, the clown gene in ball pythons and somebody sells you a desert ghost pastel clown. It was, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was like, yeah. Yeah, good. You're gonna have fun reverse engineering that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so but, well, totally. He, he says that um, he thinks that empty back is basically super stripe. But I have, you know, I come from the train of thought that things that a super stripe is an empty back, but an empty back is not necessarily a super stripe. You got it right. Yeah. So that's exactly yeah, that's, right. I wanted to come through and ask you what you thought about that. Yeah. No, I mean, super stripe is basically when you have a creamy dorsal. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you've noticed, but like we're starting to see um, 
empty heads on some of the super soft super empties so so anyway yeah i think what's going on with that there's something i don't know if it's maybe that neck margin thing i've been talking about a little bit that's causing yeah if that's causing some of that v at the back or if it's just the empty back doing that too but then yeah i mean it's there's something causing the empty back to narrow up in those super stripes but i you know i don't know if it's just the propensity for striping on a quad stripe type animal because that's i mean i don't know how far back you remember but i i know trying to kind of unravel pinstripes it's like sounds like ancient history at this point but trying to kind of figure out what was going on there uh with like creamy dorsals because you couldn't see the pins anymore and it was like oh, there was all these things but anyway one of the things um was yeah some of that like that patterning within the creamy dorsal that was starting to kind of get my attention a little bit but i was really obsessed with the pinning going up to the head that was really the thing i wanted to see and we had like some like hair. yeah yeah where you could yeah. actually see it and um so yeah i started kind of pulling away from some of the creamier ones and going more with the hairy type animals to do that where they had the more def- uh defined pinning and yeah i don't know uh, at some point because that was 2012 when butler came and bought that ended up buying that gecko um i think by that point we probably had some hets but not i mean i had super empty was a new thing for me like four years ago four or five I do remember seeing a, well, maybe I don't remember correctly, but what I thought was a super empty back, back in the day on Rapashi's web or Rapashi's forum, where it had, you know, the highlighted pinning and it almost looked like Harry's type of pinning where it's. I remember. And that's what, that's what I was going to ask. Do you remember? I can't remember for the life of me. I was trying to think of this the other day. Did that get, did it have an orange back or a black back on it? Because it was a dark gecko. I th- I, and that's, think, I think it was a black. I think it was like the, the base color. I think it was black. Was it really? I, Man, but I, you know, it's that. been so long. I don't, I don't exactly remember. I know. I think uh, the Gilpins took pictures of those animals for Rapashi. So maybe they could go back and, and see exactly if they could find those pictures. I got to ask them. But I don't know. Um. So that would have been sometime between like 2004 or five and 2008, probably yeah. 2009, somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, so with the the super stripes, we were breeding them, and I don't know what Butler. I have to listen to his his podcast and see what he says. But um, most things in crested geckos, you breed it, you see it in the next generation. It's pretty pretty common how that works. Um, with these though you really don't get that with the super stripes you know it was like they were real sporadic for me and i didn't really treat the offspring like hets when i saw them so i yeah i mean i I think super stripes probably the best way to describe that would be like a super empty most likely with um and a quad stripe with a creamy dorsal so and that just, creamy dorsal, I think, is what's playing with the empty back and squishing it into a stripe. So but without a creamy dorsal, you get that you get the base color back. Dorsal. Okay. So just to be clear, for you, a super stripe is a you know obviously that thin line of empty going mm-hmm. down the middle. Of the the mid dorsal, yeah. And then the quad stripe laterals, right? Yeah. And a yeah, and a pin with so yeah, yeah a quad pin. stripe with a a quad stripe with a fifth stripe. And have you have you ever tried breeding any empty backs or super empty backs to geckos without any pinning at all? Because I always wondered if it's something that's like that's only showing up when we have the pin stripes there. Because it's you know you could think of so many you know, empty bags out there, but every single time that I think about an empty bag, the pinstripes attached to it, you know, they have to have pinstripes. So have you ever seen 
Like, what would a Harlequin without pinstriping look that's empty back? Is that even possible? Oh, I think it'd be possible. I mean, I'm just trying to, like, picture it. I don't think it would look very distinct. Yeah. It'd probably look a little bit like a phantom, but with more color. Yeah. Um, man, some of those are a bear. The phantom empty back combos. They'll have mm-hmm. tons of white. You, you know there's empty back. I actually was pulling those out of my red super empty by super empty setup, like groups that I had set up. And uh, if I didn't know any better, I'd tell you they were fully pinned out. Phantoms. In fact, I think I posted the first one as that, and then I saw the cage labels, and I was like, wow. So, I mean, they could be hit Phantom, but then we've produced other ones that are Phantom, and they don't really have the orange head and everything that you'd see on a non-Phantom. Um, what was your question? I've got to rambling on that one. It, well, it, it was, it was to, if you have ever bred, like, a uh, super anti Oh, a non-pin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, no, non, I mean, every... Non-pinstripe animal. No, I mean, I. you're talking about someone who came up in the <laughs> the early 2000s when pinstripes were all the rage. I mean, everything yeah. has pinstripe if I had anything to say about it. But no, that's a good idea. I mean, I think it would look like a phantom probably, more or less. With just it might some be side easy side to miss. Side pattern. Yeah. And have you noticed... Yeah, and depending on what that would be. Have you... Well, I mean, obviously, you've noticed that the the empty back tends to erase some of the lateral markings and limb markings as well, right? Because mm, not really, but I mean, now that you're saying that, like, I can think of a few examples where that, like, of my own, that would, yeah, because um, I, have, I have a male that's uh, that's proven to be an empty back, but he's like. He has a bunch of cream and a bunch of snowflaking and white spot all over him. So he has a, a decent amount of hot pattern. And mm-hmm. I remember when I bred him to a variety of different females, most of the babies would barely have any pattern, but they were the ones that would be empty back would barely have any pattern. Now I was like, maybe it's, you know, directly related to each other where it, it kind of like wipes out whatever is causing that eraser on the dorsal is maybe erasing some of the the door the lateral or the limb pattern i don't know what do you it could i mean especially because it seems to really attack orange you know what i'm saying like if they so like your hairy type geckos that's why those look so crazy the super empties i've produced a handful of like i have a couple adults now they're freaking wild they look like a phantom with the shaggy full-on hairy stuff but anyway um yeah man i mean um what was what sorry what you what was your question the on the with the oh the limbs Uh, yeah yeah now what i was gonna say a second ago was i'm tying all this together as we're talking about it i was just i don't know if you saw my post on ig but on instagram but um the empty head thing where it's a super soft i mentioned it a minute ago but that totally makes sense because it's kind of attacking the orange that's where we were um i could totally see that being do you make do you notice do you notice that phantom also works similar where it it kind of like masks the orange but when oh yeah yeah that's why a lot of these Black ones look brownish because they have that orange all over that's faded. Go ahead. Yeah, but when you put like those, like the white spot trait on a phantom, you get those really high white pore holes on the side and stuff, and it sticks out even through the phantom. You know what I'm talking about? I know. Yeah, you- we've been. Yeah, that's like the just the regular flecking that you would see, not even white spot in mine. Um, that the just the regular little porthole dots but i bred uh, i was trying to put white walls on them is what happened oh. and uh and we started getting some with just bigger bigger portholes which i think a lot of people have them now but um i when i say i was trying to do it on some i mean i like i'm trying to do a phantom everything like everything and now we've got 
as soon as I do Phantom, everything empty back swoops in, and it's like oh, now we've got a third platform that I want to play with. But I'm doing, I want to do Phantom, like everything I do in a non Phantom, I want to do it with a Phantom too. And so I started doing that. And yeah, I, did you see some of the crazy ones I have with the white blobs all over the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sent me some pictures a little while back. Yeah. So that's, that's like, uh, that's kind of the porthole white wall kind of equivalent, you know, the porthole version of, because the white wall is kind of a, a super white out with lateral striping that makes it all solid and linear. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who would have thought that? Yeah. And they I don't know. really look like that great as babies. Jordan, my, my shop manager thought I was making mistakes or something, holding some of that stuff back. He's, you know, I was showing it to him. He's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever they you say. Like maybe tiny little white portholes as babies. Yeah. And- one day they just blow up and it's all white. Yeah, know. and it's just, and it, yeah, and that's what he started seeing them and telling me about them, and I was like, okay, I knew they were going to look better than they did, but I didn't know, like, I had no idea it was going to be this. <laughs> um, and we're still, we're not producing a ton of those, but when they come, they'll come. Like it was um, maybe a little over a year ago when I started kind of getting those and starting to notice what they were the supers because we uh, those i didn't even bother tracking them like i knew what they were going to be because we did quite a few groups yeah did um so when it comes to to the soft scales when how exactly did you notice that you had soft scale stuff in your collection before you actually made it public because i have soft scale animals the supers are i would say they're a lot easier to tell especially oh, because yeah they get kind of like that that spot in their head and then some some of them have the rim around their eyes a dark rim but right like regular soft scale i wouldn't be able to tell you especially when they're smaller no it no not when they're small at all yeah um, this one so i noticed it immediately like um this was Dude, probably like maybe the second or third shipment from Alan that I got. I only probably got like four or five shipments from him of like 20. Um, the It was the original female. And you know, it was stupid. I left her off the website. I was like, I knew like I'm going to get murdered for this if I go out and say this is different. Like this was back when everybody had a new ball python morph and it was usually bs um so i'm like i'm not even putting it on the website because i put it on the website i'm going to want to talk about it it's just that much easier for me to do so no i knew she came in in either 03 or 04 no it was 03 because i paired her up and got eggs in 04 um paired her up with harry Um, but i knew that gecko was different I just didn't know if I thought it'd be like kind of a selectively bred thing. Um, and never treated it any differently than that. I just produced some and, and really held on to most of them. And, um, there are pictures of the first generation soft scales on my web, on my old website, the 2008 one that's still around. I need to put a link to that on my website now, but anyway, uh, no, I noticed it right away, but it was, probably man what was that 2013 when i announced it 14 maybe yeah um it was around then when we really knew there was a super um but it was one of the it was really weird because it was just one of those things we talked about around my facility just anybody that worked there would talk about them because they are different, especially some of the supers, but even some of the soft scales. And that's why I kind of, when I see people talking about doing these macros and stuff like that, I don't know how accurate that's going to be because like that original soft scale from Alan, um, I don't think she was a super, but she was noticeable enough. I mean, most like, most soft scales now they kind of blend in there's so many of them out there it's it's kind of a spectrum of how soft they really are but um 
but yeah, I mean, she was very noticeable and I don't, you know, not a super, not like that, but she was very noticeable to me. It was just, you know, like I said, I didn't think it was deliberate enough that it would be a genetic what? mutation. I thought it would be more something we could breed for. So I thought like that velvety feel with the hairy shagginess yeah. would be cool to play with. What, um, that, what morph combo or, or color base do you think it pairs up the best with the soft scale? Oh man, I, that's a tough one. I mean, because black looks really good. I mean, like a really good, super soft and black. I mean, they are black. Yeah. Um, but I mean, probably some of the brightest and most impressive geckos I've ever seen in terms of color have been yellow or orange um, super socks. I mean, and there are some good red ones too, but I think it's the C2 line that's making it kind of unfair. Because yeah. I mean, that's kind of like a hypo in and of itself, whatever you want to call it. Um, the uh, So yeah, some of the yellow super softs are pretty wild in person and they really don't look that great um, on camera. Let me grab a, I'm going to grab a Diet Coke real quick. Yeah, go. Excuse me. I guess go you can it. still hear me. You can still hear yeah, me. Yeah, I can hear you. The AirPods. Mm -hmm. There we go. So, yeah. Uh, the. Um, do, um, do you. Do you. Like, at this point, do you. You don't look through a microscope or take a macro shot of a gecko to know if it's super soft or soft. You just, you could kind of just Raise tell. Them. Yeah. I don't sell anything really is, um, uh, super. I mean, cause everything I put up on the website's an adult. So those are, that's a slam dunk. You can kind of tell, but I'll still, I mean, some of that stuff, you watch me list it, it'll say possible super. Cause the, I mean, it, you know, I don't trust them all unless I know it came out of supers, you know, two yeah. supers, then you can count. I mean, e even the babies, you could count on that, but, um, nah, I don't, I, and I've always said that, like, even the day I announced it at the super soft, I said, I never thought it was going to be marketable because the soft scale was just so subtle. Yeah. And then you plug it, I plugged it into all that hairy stuff and they're shaggy and that didn't make it any easier to pick out. Yeah. You know, because now you're playing with it two different ways. So that makes me wonder, like, I was telling somebody not that long ago, like, I think Lily is some kind of a soft scale type of uh, mutation. I think it has something to the scales because I really like the Lily. I, I did Lily by Super Soft. And I mean, you know, they're soft scales, but they don't look that different to me. Uh, yeah. The, like the at all. The lilies seem to, I don't know, the lilies seem to do something with everything. They do something to the color. They do something to the pattern. They do something to the structure of the animal in, in regards to the well, scale. Yeah, and the white spreads like crazy. Oh, um, yeah. That's pretty weird in and of itself. Yeah, it's, it's unlike any of the other uh, morphs that we have, for sure. Yeah. Have you, yeah, have, that's... you have you uh, I have you noticed that some of the lilies will get like it almost looks like an extra layer of of skin or especially like when it comes to like the harlequin markings or on the sides they get yeah, like that... a layer of skin or like a thicker you know kind of bubbles up yeah kind of bubbles out or whatever no I know what you're talking about like we'll see I'll see geckos, some of the lilies we have, because we're plugging tangerine in there. Yeah. Tangerine likes to accumulate on that that funky stuff. Yeah. Where it's popping up like that. So you'll see a gecko that's like just smeared in white. And then wherever it's bubbled up like that has hints of tangerine popping up in it. Um, that's a whole, like, people don't understand, like with all this variation we have just naturally encrusted geckos when we start plugging genes into that stuff these a lot of them are probably other genes we haven't quite identified yet we're going to see some crazy stuff 
like crazy. And I think it's stuff like that. I mean, there's that, you know, that dark, I'm just as a working title, I've called it like dark margin or the mar the dark margin on the neck, like not as a name just to describe it, but on some of the phantoms, like where, you know, what I'm talking about, it's yeah, like, like the crooked it's almost neck. like on the inside of the dorsal, like dark highlight. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So C2 with that, and then add a bunch of tangerine and that margin lightens up and turns pink. Yeah. And so you're going to see people exploit all kinds of crazy stuff like that. And that's you really know, like, I wish I was 20 years ago playing with all this stuff now. Like I know, can really micromanage that. You could go do some wild stuff. Back, back when I started, there was a person, a breeder that had a gecko, a yellow phantom gecko with that margin thing you're talking about. That was like the only one I had seen back then. Her company name was Crested Lady. Do you remember that person? Oh, um, yeah, Sarah. No, I met her at uh, Tinley. What was that? The year of the... Were you there at the uh, symposium Alan did the first year? No, I, I didn't even get to go to that to that one. Okay, she was at that one. Um, and then I think she got out like a year or two later. But no, I totally remember her. Yeah, was her no, name she, Sarah? Yeah, Sarah? Oh, wow, bro. Sarah, I, think I think so, Sarah. Or what, what was that? I, I just now remember. I so now I know where you're going with this. I what was it? The what did she name? Blushing. I forgot. Blushing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna start blushing. <laughs> <laughs> so she, so she had this gecko that had that that weird margin, and I and I never seen that before. And recently, I think I, I tagged you on Instagram. I don't know if you got to see it, but a buddy of mine here in Florida hatched out, I think, a lily white phantom that has a really thick margin down the, you know, down the neck, all the well, way down the dorsal. That's it. We're getting it down all the way down the back now. I don't know if that's the super. It looks like it might be a super form of it. Uh, but until I saw I, until I saw it light, lighten things up and turn pink with tangerine, I was just like, I don't know if anybody's going to want to pay for that dark, dirty, yeah. uh, whatever down the back of it. But uh, yeah, no, that one, that's another thing that might be really interesting. Um, I, I, all these phantoms that I'm growing out, there's a lot. Of them. Yes. Yeah. That's me on the yellow. Considerable. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, you know, we have some red phantoms that get some dark stuff down the back, but it doesn't really contour. Yeah. And it doesn't really congregate along the inner surface of the pinning. It's more even. So I don't think it it's probably yeah. not the same thing. I don't know. Yeah. Have you um and and you said on I seen on some of the animals that you listed up on the website recently that they also seem to display it on the laterals as well the margin some of the margin that I don't know if it's that or if that's just tiger on a lot of those yeah. actually no I know what you're talking about yeah around the lat like the white part of the laterals I'm yeah there. I'm picturing that gecko you know he has it down the back too doesn't he yeah like quite a bit down the back the one yeah. with he's kind of a khaki color. Yeah, I think it's like yeah. probably the best example of a margin gecko that I saw on your website. If I'm mistaken. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And he's got the white out kind of on the sides too, and then the dark stuff around it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think that's that could be like the super form of that. I mean, there's there's so many of those. Like, I have ton, tons of them. It's not going to be anything expensive but i think it could be a really cool thing the entire community can kind of play around with and see what we can do with it yeah 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 i'm excited for it i i also um i'm interested in like the the pixels that you've been posting up some of them there's like a clear distinction that i see like almost like the harlequin markings on the side the very edges of it get kind of like disintegrated yeah but it's hard to pinpoint exactly what the pixel is doing in some other geckos it's I don't know if you have kind a of, description of it yeah we've i mean i've been trying to kind of put my finger on it too um it kind of eats away at the dorsal in the same way you're talking about yeah 
the edges of the pinning like there's one i think there's only one left available on the website now but it's a little he's bigger than he was in those pictures but he's probably like three or four grams in the pictures he's a hairy line one and you can see like the 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 pinstripe scales or whatever they're trying to be long and and shaggy but there's only like half as many as you would normally see um because pixel's kind of eating away at part of the dorsal um mm. so i'm seeing that and then like you said if they have laterals it's doing that now if they have like orange harlequin markings on the side i'm seeing more of that pixelation or the you know whatever you want to call it same if they have portholes in with the harlequin instead of like whiteout type stuff or white yeah. holes, um i'm seeing that too yeah so yeah it's a weird one i d what i do see also are usually holes in the in the inner part of the dorsal like not in the middle but along the inner edges kind of where margin where we were just talking about where that would be right they tend to put little there's like oh i wish i could put one up on the screen a picture um we could, if anything, you could send it to me and I could put it up later. Before oh, yeah, because we're pre-recording. Okay. Well, let's, yeah, I know which one I want to, I'll show you. But basically, you're seeing dots in the middle. That was really the first thing I noticed was dots on the inner part, like on the dorsal itself. And then it kind of started to eat into the outer edges of the dorsal, too. And then, of course, the pixelation on the sides. But, yeah, when we got the white walls, it also like how it kind of disintegrates them, but it seemed to want to flatten them out a little bit. Too. Yeah, like it suppressed it, like he kept it down, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's what gave room for then the other. You had a layer of harlequin kind of rising above it. Yeah, that's what yeah. I think. That's what really. That's what got me motivated to talk about it. I know that, but I think that I got a lot of people interested. So uh, I think there's a couple other, maybe one or two other genes that are rightfully being called pixel, uh, but might be different. I don't know. It just so seems as, like a lot of variation for one gene. As it stands right now, do you still think it's an incomplete dominant where it's, you know, there's a super form? and Seem, Seems to be, but it could be more of just a dominant thing. I don't know. I, I think it is probably more more likely incomplete dominant. Uh, now, are you going to be able to tell the difference between the supers and the pixels? Uh, I don't really know. I mean, saw yeah. scale hasn't been fun for that. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's crazy because some super softs you just know automatically and then other ones you're not quite so sure. And I think some of these might end up like that too. But it's been in my collection quite a while. We were trying to pin it down. It was impossible. I think the best estimate I came up with was like seven years. And then somebody sends me a screenshot of an email I sent them 2015 calling it a gene. So I don't know. It was probably at least 10 years ago when that popped up. But have you uh, it, you have see you, it in so many different combos, it's hard to really pick them all out. You yeah, go back yeah. And reverse engineer it. It's definitely it's definitely one of those things that is hard to pinpoint, especially like for example on that tricolor white wall thing that we were talking about. I think you sold that to Gecko Harmony. That gecko is very evident. It's easy to see it, but on some oh, other yeah. geckos, it's just harder to like to dis you know to distinguish. Um. Yeah. I mean the ones. He actually got two of those white walls. Um, they, yeah, those were the first ones that really intrigued me, but I knew it was the same gene as the other stuff I had. Um, so, yeah, I'm trying to, like, think back. Prior to those, I really didn't care much about the entire thing. Like, I knew we were going to have to announce it because yeah. I knew it was a gene and I knew we were going to play with it. But I I didn't know when exactly I was going to do it. And then I saw those. I was like, oh, people are going to want to see this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that one, like, if you notice, though, those have that, that little the dot pattern I was talking about just to the inside, kind of where margin would be. Yeah. Um, that'd be interesting, pixel with margin. 
be poking yeah. holes in that or not. It might cover it up. I don't know. Um, but those have that too. They have any dots in those and the pattern of those are going to be along the outer edge. Empty backs, another one. Dan and I are really interested in Gecko Harmony. He's yeah. got a killer empty back stuff. Yeah, I see. Uh, yeah, so I don't know how that's going to play either. If because empty back is another one that eats into the the dorsal. Um, so I don't know how well that little row of dots is going to show up. But right now we see it on pretty much, I would say all of them. I can't, I'm trying to think because I'm, as soon as I say all of them, somebody's going to send me a picture of a pixel I sold that doesn't have that yeah. there. But I, as far as I remember, I think all of them have that. Uh, have you, have you bred it to the white yet? No, I haven't done much of anything. I did empty, empty to Lily and soft to Lily and tangerine to Lily. And that's really it right now. Gotcha. Um, I I want to. That's going to be. Uh, I actually want to plug a lot of that in, there, uh, mm -hmm. Lily. Um, or I need to. Like I haven't done a super empty Lily. Um, that'll have the pointy thing we were talking about. That where it comes to a point at the neck. I would think. The super empty Lily, but the the pixel Lily. I think you're probably going to see those dots and stuff. Same way, but what's it going to do to all that white on the sides is what I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if it's and the babies. Yeah. The babies might not, you might not be able to see it at all in the babies. I mean, until all that white comes in for the lily. When mm -hmm. all that comes in, I think it's going to be interesting uh, what to see what Pixel ends up doing with that. Um, but no, right now, I mean, the white wall, uh, those really, the only thing I tried with it, um, but they're in all kinds of colors. I think I have it in red, in some of my red empty back stuff. Yeah. Um, but I got to play around with those because they're tougher to tell because that that uh, row of dots down the, the dorsal, they're, they don't show up with the empty back kind of fading everything out. Right. So I just want to breed those and make sure what they are before I show them off too much. How how many adult like pixels would you say you have breeding right now? I uh, I don't know, man. Not many, not many at all. I mean, since March, I've been flagging them like crazy, like everyone I see. And if I had twenty five out of 15,000 animals I'd be surprised right now I'm sure there are some I haven't flagged or haven't seen yet because I haven't gone through everything but I mean it hadn't been many there's not that many of them um because it wasn't really anything I ever made it a point to set it up in groups or do anything with some of them I actually made it a point not to until I figured it out because I once I figured it out it was genetic I just started saving them instead of putting them putting them in groups, breeding groups. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd say, I mean, right now, identified in the building, maybe a couple dozen of them is all I've got. So uh, I think since March, I've hatched maybe 10 or 12 of those. Okay. March is when those, um, the white walls, when those came out. Right. So you, so so you hatched it and those are pretty much like, the some of the first ones you ever sold mm -hmm. like oh, well know. those were yeah that was the first year i sold them i actually hatched those last year not those the ones i sold in march uh to or i don't know when dan bought them exactly i know the ones i posted in march um i had done i actually that breeding group that made those had gotten rolling the year prior so i had adults i sold mm. one i sold one adult like like that she didn't have so much of the the orange coming up over the cream on the sides, but a big adult female to uh, nice. Harry. To, to Harry, Zero's yeah. Gecko. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was so, a nice. Yeah. Yeah, she's cool. So, yeah, we've hatched a handful of those, but that's uh, kind of a tougher one. Like, we're not getting a lot of them. It's probably um, – maybe a one and eight type gecko right now in the pairings that I'm getting them from. So like 
probably some white wall soft scale um, pixel with uh, maybe some super soft. I can't remember if they're soft scales or supers, but anyway, but to get a super soft white wall pixel out of those groups is not, not common right now. Do you I think I've probably got like five? How how many like geckos do you have per group typically? Four. One male, three females. Yeah. One male, three females. And do you do you find that's the best, the most effective way to keep groups together versus like one point two or one point one? Um for me, I mean, yeah, as long as you're not trying to micromanage what egg comes out of what which female exactly. Yeah. Um I know like some people it depends like for the industrial like commercial breeders that are doing numbers everybody thinks those guys are going to have really gross cages like those guys are swapping papers out like every week or two yeah um but they're running they'll run like 1.5 in a group so uh i don't know what like when when geckos are growing and and growing up uh they're not good to house together in my opinion they just grow about half as fast it's yeah i wouldn't say not good it just doesn't go as easily or as fast as if you put them by themselves but once they're breeding dude those females like most of the time we find them piled up on top of each other like they're not solitary cre i can't believe they're solitary creatures if they're all deciding to hang out together um yeah same I, oftentimes when you you know you open up the group you'll see like all of them stacked up on each other in yeah. one corner yeah. yeah and you know it's probably not the sweetness that we all think it is it's probably they realize if they're in a group of five that's they have a four that times is. better chance of getting away <laughs> you, yeah. when a bird comes or whatever but whatever yeah. that is they're comfortable together um uh, even and like i don't i don't pull the males out ever yeah. Um, I know some people want to give the females a rest. That was my, what I said way back when is what I, why I did it. And I quit doing it after a year or two. Um, a lot of it's just pheromones. Once the females are done for the season, the males don't bother them much. Um, and the other thing is, I mean, once you get a female bred, she'll lay eggs the rest of the season without needing to be bred again. I've had it happen. Yeah. Do you, um, do you mess with the temperatures throughout the year in your facility or are you just kind of like keeping a constant temperature throughout the whole time? No, I mean, I run like my whole place is run on mini splits and they're yeah. not, they're not super powerful. I mean, it gets cold. The building gets a little colder. It's harder to keep up. If it gets hot, the, the building is typically a little warmer. So we kind of go with the seasons yeah um and i know i mean i don't try to temperature cycle anything and i'll tell you really i they don't know that different. yeah i don't they all have their own seasons for sure and it's funny because if you set up a bunch of groups at the same time they start laying as a group and and will stop laying as a group yeah um and i've seen it i've had my entire collection stop laying as a group and I don't know what, I, I have an idea. I know light is part of it. But anyway, what I was going to say is light is a much bigger issue. Light cycles are a much bigger issue than temperature. I've had, you know, we had, what was that, 2020 or 19? We had like a bitter cold winter in Kansas City. It was like, I don't remember. I think my shop was getting down to like 60, 62 at night. Yeah. And I was like, man, I've never let them get this cold before. We had space heaters in certain areas, keeping like babies, keeping them up or whatever. But uh, I, I was really expecting maybe everything to shut down because you think, God, if people cool animals to, to get ready to breed or whatever, like this, this is definitely going to have an impact. And all it did, it really all it did was slow it down. And it, when that happens, when you have the temperatures drop like that, it seems like it slows everybody down. But then once they all, um, once they all get caught up on whatever eggs were gestating in them, like in that cycle, they get kind of back onto a, a another cycle 
where it's maybe instead of laying every 28 days, they'll lay every 35 or something like that while it's cold. And yeah. then you'll see it just ramp right back up as soon as you spike, as soon as the temperatures go back up. I call it spike when they hit maximum, which is 70, 75 is as hot as I want it to get. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think light is the biggest deal. If we, if you have uh, an open window in your facility, you're going to have a lot more seasonality um, in your land. Yeah. Have you, have you heard, I know, you know, the general train of thought is that you don't want to get um, crested and everything over like 85 degrees because it could be dangerous. It could dehydrate, whatever. But have you heard of people here in Florida, there's been people that have been keeping them outside. Now, they keep them, obviously, away from the sun. In the shade, yeah. In the shade. But mm -hmm. we have, you know, 90 degree, 95 degree days. And sure. And they seem to be doing well for some of the people that, that keep them like that. One person in particular that does that is Ron St. Pierre. And he, you know. He does all I, kinds actually, of lizards outdoor, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, he does. He does a, a bunch of different stuff, but I've been meaning to go down there and, and talk to him about it because he's saying he's keeping his crescents outside in this heat and, and they're well, producing and they're driving. So. Yeah, he's not keeping babies in that. I don't know. I don't think so, but I don't know. Because I would expect babies in the wild because, you know, I watch, I've got New Caledonia on my weather app because I'm a nerd. Yeah, I just good. watch it. Okay, so you know you know what it is too. It's sixty five to eighty five or eighty seven. That's eighty seven is uh, the typical daytime high in New Caledonia. It's the craziest thing. But anyway, no, I don't doubt it. Um, the humidity too. They need if it's high humidity and eighty seven degrees, it wouldn't surprise me at all because I think a lot of their trouble with high temperature is the yeah the the when it gets hot especially like um oh i'm trying to think of a good example but you know like we warm it up in our car or whatever it overheats in the car i mean that's different than than being in humid you know having that ocean right. breeze from florida or whatever uh, right. but no like john mack was telling me they're doing i don't know how, I haven't talked to him about, I've talked to him just recently, but not about uh, the setup, but they started doing hydroponic tables in their warehouses. So basically you have, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of, but basically it's like, I don't know where he got this idea. I need to ask him that, but it's basically like a hydroponic table. You would grow whatever vegetables or whatever. Yeah. But instead of growing plants in this stuff, he's got filtration balls and stuff. And then they go into, the, here's where it gets crazy. They, they filter into a sump in the floor of the warehouse. And it's got all kinds of media down there to filter this water back through. And on top of that are grates. And on top of the grates are cages. And the geckos poop into the water that's being filtered. And they're getting blasted with humidity constantly. Yeah. And he said it's getting like 90 degrees, 85 degrees in the warehouse. And they're just jamming. In there. They're fine. That's insane. So I don't know, man. It's weird. Now, I will tell you in my shop, we keep it humid with a like an NFL size swamp cooler, like the giant fan you see on the side of the field. Yeah. On the sidelines. So. Um, I keep it 70% in there. Um, it's, it is what it is. I mean, you, there's some drawbacks to keeping it that humid in your place for sure. But, um, uh, I know when we get to 80 degrees, uh, the, the metabolisms, like if it gets to 80 in my shop, their metabolisms go like kick into high gear oh yeah we'd have to add a feeding day to keep them from shutting down i think yeah um because like we ran them pretty hard letting the temperatures get into the high 70s early summer probably may june and uh i watched the egg numbers drop off which was absolutely fine this season but um <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah they it 
I don't know, man. It it would it would scare me to keep them that hot. I would be afraid. It'd be very seasonal. You'd probably get a clutch every 21, 25 days for six months. Yeah. Um, and the way I run way I run my stuff, I'll probably get a clutch every thirty to, uh, yeah, thirty. Oh, probably yeah. every 30 days and it's you know nine months out of the year eight months out of the year our stuff's been very um even as far as production since 2019 19 i had a bad bad production year um we had i fed a bunch of giant mealworms couldn't get couldn't get crew. It was middle of the winter. Couldn't get, couldn't even get large mealworms. I had to buy the giants that are yeah. treated with hormones. And I looked into it and everybody I talked to said I was probably going to be fine. So I went ahead and did it because I wanted to fatten everything up. The next week we got like 400 eggs and 280 of them were bad when they were collected. Another 80 of them went bad within a week of that. From those, from those like, giant mealworms? I, I mean, it, it took me about a year to put it all together, but it, it messed with my production for about a year. Production and hatch yeah. rates were real low. I hatched 8,000 geckos instead of 22 or whatever I should have that year. Uh, do you um do you have a constant dish of mealworms in the enclosures with the water? No. And no, what? No, we do. Well, we do when we're feeding them, but they only get them every other week. Either those are, cr if it's crickets, we don't do the dish. We do mealworms, right. it's in a dish. Uh, but no, I'll leave them in all week and then they're gone. They don't get them again when they get their diet because you know what happens if you give them their choice of yeah. bugs or diet. Eh. So we we basically, we'll see the first feeding a diet not go over very well and then the second feeding a diet. After they had worms, now they're getting hungry again. They'll eat it. Um, but yeah, you can. Uh, I I'd love to be able to just keep them topped off all the time. We just can't get enough. Yeah. Insects. Yeah, it's crickets are really hard to get the numbers we need. What's that? I said there's been a shortage this year for sure, with crickets and a lot of insects feeders. Yeah, yeah, crickets are really tough, man. I had. I don't, what year, would you remember the cricket virus? I don't know. I think that was early, um, I don't know. I don't remember exactly when that happened, but I do, you know, that, that took a big hit. And that's why that, that started different companies that were bringing the, the banded crickets. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, that like changed the industry a little bit. But that's when we discovered mealworms work. Yeah, there there used to be all these rumors that mealworms were, you know, the exoskeleton was too tough or they would eat through your gecko. I remember people saying that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought, and this is before I even knew much about geckos of any type. I I remember telling people, I can't imagine a crested gecko chasing a mealworm down. They yeah. probably wouldn't, you know, because the mealworms will crawl right under the paper. But if you do it in a yeah. dish, they learn that real fast. Oh, yeah. Like real yeah. fast. It's so funny. We'll we'll open cages and see the gecko staring into a totally <laughs> empty mealworm dish, waiting for something to move, and there's nothing left in that dish, and they're just yeah, they're just there. <laughs> stalking it, waiting for somebody to refill that thing. They're not the brightest. No. Uh, do you do you still do? I remember a while back I saw on your website you would have like kind of pictures of what your breeder setups would look like, and you would basically have like. Um, Egg crates kind of like positioned in a certain way mm -hmm. with like a fake plant or two and then a lay box. Is that how you still are doing it? Yeah, minus the fake plant. We do some of the babies I'll do fake plants, especially when we get backed up like this. I like the ones Matt has, the uh the suction cup plants yeah. from Pangea. Yeah. Ours look like weed, which goes well for my guys. But <laughs> uh the shop, they love that. But um but we, I'll suction those on, especially in the taller tubs, the 58s, yeah. I'll suction a bunch of those on because it breaks up a lot of the airflow in those cages that call, I think cause stuck shed. Yeah. Um, and they're good for holding water droplets when you missed them, yeah. all yeah. those leaves. So yeah, but anyway, in my breeder setups, we're not doing that anymore just because you, you know, every time you pull them out, they're covered in 
poo. Yeah. yeah. But um, but yeah, it's pretty much that. I mean, we have the egg carton for the hides. I usually have like two or three pieces of that stacked up, so it's heavy. Um, and the nest box is in the back of the tub. That's they all congregate around the edge of the nest box between that and the the wall of the cage. Yeah. Because that six that six quart nest box fits right in the back there, perfect. And then all the food's up at the front. But yeah, that's pretty much it, man. It's I've kept them in the same type of cages since I started. Like when I had, I mean, I've never kept them in glass at all. Yeah. Um, Especially a big collection like that, it'd be a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Your yeah. bag, and I have, I have my frozen. share. I have my share of glass exoterras with other stuff, but yeah, for these guys, man, it's just I like being able to pick the tubs up and work. Yeah. Do you? Uh, uh, so when when I remember when the when the cappuccinos first started popping out and stuff, and people started talking about it, we we were talking about you know the cappuccinos and you told me that that mac had a bunch do you have you picked up any from him are you going to be hmm. playing with that stuff or no yeah i don't i don't know yeah i probably will play with that gene i don't know though with the super being the way it is i may look at the sables i, I kind of i haven't figured out where those came from <clears throat> um but yeah that was a weird one because like all those caps are hairy line stuff the ones coming out of korea well yeah i sent tons of my stuff to korea and i think wherever was it who started the caps is that don well so don don named it caps and he and he had a bunch and stuff but i think i think they trace back to reptiles by mac oh so they're absolutely a hundred percent because yeah. john when he saw it start popping off, he was like, "Uh oh!" He called me and he's like, "What's going on? Like, what, what do you think this is?" And I'm like, "Well, I, I haven't followed this closely enough either, but I'll find out." So I dug into it, and uh, he didn't know what the heads looked like or anything. He was shipping them out in wholesale shipments. Yeah, yeah. I know. And um, and then he's got this other one. Have you seen the pinky? Yes. That, that, a, that no that's what we thought we were really confused about that and he was still we're not real clear what's going on with that but like um it, it kind of seems like there's another one out there somebody else has yes so i was just gonna say you're talking that. about uh, i think uh, that's the same uh, thing so reptiles by mac had sent out a, a wholesale email you know releasing you know showcasing the pinky and everything mm -hmm. And I posted that on my Instagram, you know, showing it like, oh, look at, you know, the the crested gecko stuff is starting to heat up, basically. And oh, somebody, yeah. somebody contacted me, which he 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 said he popped out this genetic super hypo that is a leucistic gecko from two animals that were hypos, and it's viable. And it and he sent me videos and he sent me pictures and everything, and the gecko looks healthy. And then fast forward a couple months, he showed it. He went and did a NARBC show and he took the gecko there and everybody saw it and everything. But so Brian Burnett. Yes, exactly. So I think that's the same thing. I do too. But um after after yeah, I was I was talking to him I about those and then um right in the midst of all that, John got in touch and showed me he's like you know showing me these and ask him what i thought i'm like told him i said i need more pictures give me you know get me pictures of little ones i want to see what their skin on their heads looks like stuff like that and then and he did and it looks like the same thing and then where it's getting really weird with his what he was showing me is like he sent me a picture of two caps that are I mean, for me to be able to tell you they're caps, they're, they're caps. Like, I've seen enough of those floating around, and I went on the wild goose chase digging through my stuff looking for, you know, because we didn't know if it was coming out of here or what. But anyway, as many caps as I've looked for and never found, I, as soon as John sent me pictures of these Hetley cystic cresteds, I'm like, those are caps. And he's like, well, it's because we thought they were related. And yeah, I think there were 
what he sent me pictures of, I think it was, what was funny was one was super dark and one was not, one was light colored. Yeah. But they supposedly came from a leucistic bred to a het, you know, a cap. You shouldn't get, you should be two hypos, maybe one cap, one not, but they look both cap is what it looked like to me. I don't know. So basically we're unclear right now as to whether John doesn't think the hypo. I kind of, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe they didn't get it wrong at, at John. Cause I mean, there's so much going on there. It, it, it'd be like me, but um, John doesn't think the hypo part of it has anything to do with the leucistic. He's doesn't believe that. Hmm. So I don't know. Um, he's wondering he thinks it may be recessive and he thinks maybe there's some other hypo stuff going on. That's totally, you know, just not related. It just happens to be there. I, that's why I don't have any right now. I'm very interested in that one. Yeah. Like, um, uh, almost more for the, if, especially if it's the hypo, like Brian saying, um, if that's the head, which would make sense because that sounds like the fireball python. Yeah. Head, head and everything. Um, also, I don't know that if Brian has hatched more than one, but I know John has on the leucistics, and they a lot of them have that patchy yellow on the head and dorsal. Um, that in a super fireball python, that's pretty typical, a black-eyed leucistic. Yeah. Uh, you can you can get some i've produced them perfectly clean white and i've also produced them with loads of yellow on the, yeah. the head you know though it's funny because that yellow typically seems to be centered around the like the brain stem and the dorsal um and yeah. someone someone explained or tried to explain it to me years ago but basically where the where the color is being interrupted, there's something to do with it's it's related to the spine, the spine and the the brain, and so any any color that actually happens to get through that gene is usually located there. It's going to be con or concentrated there. I don't know, but anyway, I, I noticed it right away in the ones John sent me pictures of. So I think. It very well, especially if the hypo happens to be the heterozygous version of it. You almost it ha almost has to be the same gene, the fire gene um, from ball pythons. Black yeah. eyes, black eyes. I mean, everything lines up. Even the head patch on a fireball python. Yeah, those are those are super interesting. But uh, there was recently a guy that hatched one in Korea, and he said they came out of two cappuccino animals now a white you know, one yeah the white one and john yeah i mean he's thought the same thing but that's it john has both in his colony yeah. the guy in korea may have very well gotten cappuccinos that are heteroleucistic that's true but yeah, yeah there's there's oh. been some confusion on that that's why like i'd probably go ahead and buy them anyway uh but but yeah, right now I'm kind of like, man, I kind of, I want to see, I just want to make sure I'm not buying heads that don't end up being heads. That's right. My biggest fear. Yeah. I want to make sure I know what those are. Um, but yeah, that one, the hypo part of that is very interesting to me because it, it'll go with what we want the geckos to look like anyway, lightning, brightening, that kind of stuff. And then, um, I think a white crested gecko would probably be pretty cool too. Yeah, I mean it's it's um, what Super Lily could have been, you know. Yeah, totally. Have you um so so you have you have seen the sables, right? Have you oh, have yeah. you had any interest? Have you seen the sables yet? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, that's a lilac, a lilac with cap, as far as I know. Yeah, exactly. That's what that's what um Anthony over at Little Monster Reptiles have been saying. Have you had any interest in working with those? I I seem to think that the sables look a little bit better than the cappuccinos, and it's a, you know, I do too. Similar, but it what it does with the white is just like very very interesting. It it almost yeah, it seems really like, cool. 
yeah, I've seen some cool ones where it's kind of putting white where you don't normally see it or kind of letting it flow together. Um, you almost always have that, the frosted crests when you get that yeah. white there. Yeah, and we've seen something similar in mine. I don't know. I don't know where I'm trying to figure out where the sable came from because there's usually one there's usually a source and then there's usually somebody else that identifies it, proves it kind of deal like it. Yeah. A lot of times they leak and so that's like cappuccino that started in John Max colony and they were getting super caps. Um I got pictures of super caps before they were produced in Korea and we didn't know what they were. Yeah. Um so, I mean, this stuff's there. It's just people don't, not everybody comes out talking about it right away. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think, um, well, the, the sable the, the, originated from Cindy at Gecko Haven, or okay. at least that's as, as far that's as that's who know. proved it out, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, then she sold a bunch to Korea, and then you know, Korea has really taken Gecko it. Haven. Is that Cindy McDonald? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. <clears throat> I don't, man, I don't know. Yeah. I am interested in it. What the super is just kind of a weird, doesn't it have like a little bit of pattern down the back, but no real pinning. Yeah. It's almost like, it's almost like a phantom or like a super cap that has a little bit of dorsal pattern. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I like the, some of the heads, like the combos and stuff. And I, yeah, I would be interested in playing with that one too. This, especially if the super is not messed up. Yeah. No, um, it, looks, it looks fine as far as I've seen. And their nose, their nostril size is like normal. Normal. Um, that's what I was going to say. That's the big one right there. So yeah. I would not purposely produce the super caps just personally, just because yeah. everything I do, I get, you know, I catch flack for it. If I'm propagating, yeah. that but um yeah i think a lot of these caps and and um uh the het leucistic whatever they are i think are going to be like double hets a lot of these animals because john wasn't sure and i they intentionally bred it together um, right so yeah man i, I uh that'd be a bummer to get a super cap leucistic when you're just trying for a leucistic and you're like what yeah. is this and i've seen animals that i think that's what they are kind yeah. of jacked up looking but they're leucistic and it's like yeah i don't think that's an in-between i think it's both yeah um I... the chances of them being a lelic and in the same collection i mean that's just not not likely Right. So I, I think you got a lot of double hit animals that are going to prove out to be both. And that kind of, eh, I don't know. I guess if the, the super caps, if you're only getting like one in four, it's not going to kill you. And I, I, I just would try not to do that. Try not to get as many of those. Right. Or try not to get very many of them. But yeah, there's, God, there's some crazy stuff going on right now. Chris. Yeah. Ones. I know, um, I know you've told me in the past that you're not a, a like a big fan of like the Xantics because from ball pythons they tend to like brown out and stuff. But oh yeah, but you you have seen those lily white Xantics, right? I have, and that got me kind of yeah. asking questions a little bit. And yeah, the Xanthic, I I'm kind of coming to the realization finally, probably a lot later than most, but. It's kind of its own base color. It's not really a, I, I always imagined what it was, was like just removing yellow pigment, leaving everything else intact. I, as far as I know, you can't produce a red one or a yellow one. Well, like so that base color comes with it, right? Yeah, so it's it kind of like works almost similar to the Phantom where it wipes out some of that orange pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't really have like Harlequin Asiantics unless they have that white pattern. But the the yellow, like let's say you know, yellow Asiantics have been bred so much. You know, they originally Brian Butler was trying to produce like an all white gecko, and he thought he would do that by producing. Oh, I C2. yeah, I mean, we he and I talked about yeah, exactly. He's my yeah. C two line. 
And that was our whole, like, I told him early on, like, that'd be the first play I'd make with it. Like, see what it does with yellow. If it can wipe yellow out, that's legit. Yeah. But it, it seems to be like a layer on top of yellow because you'll see some Azantics that have yellow that are like from two yellow head parents, for example. And mm -hmm. I have one female that looks like she's Azantic. She's a visual Azantic. But you could see like as she's gotten older, you see some of the yellow undertones in her in her chin and on top of her head. So like it's like it's almost like the Azantic is a layer on top and it's like almost covering that. Hmm. It's the, it's see, and the, well, and here's the thing with like what you mentioned earlier about why I don't like Azantic ball pythons and. I don't know that I would stand by that position today with some of the stuff we're producing that I have nothing to do with uh, in our collection, mine and Jake's. But anyway, um, the reason they get brown is that like pigments, uh, carotenoid pigments, you know, um, yellow, orange, whatever, whatever's in whatever they are eating ends up in the top layer of their skin. And I think that actually uh, coincidentally, is why soft scale and super soft scales are so much cleaner looking in, in a lot of cases because I think they lack that, but that layer of skin. But anyway, back to Azanthic, I think that's what's causing it in ball pythons. Now, what I was saying a minute ago, where I think it's kind of a base color linked thing, that's totally different than what I don't like, the Azanthic I don't like. But right. I've seen. I mean, some of these definitely, these azanthic animals look brown to me. I think if it had a different name, I probably would have been a lot sooner uh, to the party on it. Um, but yeah, I'm starting to see some pretty cool stuff with that. And in fact, that idea that a base color could be genetic like that or, or whatever that is, I mean, it's it makes sense because like my C2 stuff, you pretty much you can breed those to whatever you want and you're going to get some c2 looking animals in the next generation they really you don't have to do much selective breeding for it like i bred them into black stuff bred them into everything you always get some of those freckled kind of hypo we look in uh, yellows so anyway yeah the azanthic i think is going to be cool especially um the fraps, some of those are really neat. Has has anybody done uh, sable yet? Sable Azantics? Mm -hmm. uh, not that I, I don't think so. I know there's some guys in Korea that have had some Azantic cappuccinos. Now, it starts to get hard to, you know, tell the difference. Pick them out. Others, but they, they've, they've done that so far. But I think, you know, like with the fraps and the sable lily whites, I think right now the coolest, and even the Azantics, the coolest thing you could do with any of these morphs is put it to Lily White. Yeah, I mean, it's such a wild yeah. gene. And then on top of that, I mean, like I was saying earlier, some of these little nuances, like the yellow tips on some of the scales and just different things popping out, I think you're going to see different effects and it's going to be completely unexpected stuff because I've not my first rodeo i went through the ball python craze you know in the early to mid 2000s when why would cinnamon by pastel make a black and silver ball python that made no sense you know remember the pewter yeah the pewter yeah i mean that but you're talking about a reddish kind of reddish tone animal with the one that's bright yellow like uh, just to me that was mind-blowing it was like why is that why is that combo silver so i think we're going to see a lot of that in crested geckos where these things are going to come out not looking at, at all like what we thought um but yeah i mean with that you're going to get a lot of um false alarms too i mean i've had people send me colored or not colored light colored phantoms in pictures you know they'll send pictures of these geckos and I think I got a leucistic and it's like, no, yeah. that's, that's, that's just a tan phantom. It's cool. Yeah. You know, it's a, probably a C2 or something, but I've seen some pretty funny stuff too. Like people think they have something. And so you're going to have a lot of that out there. People just have to exercise caution with some of that stuff, but 
um, a lot, I think a lot of people, uh, uh, kind of get into that mode where anything genetic is, they think anything genetic is good and you gotta, you gotta watch out, especially if you have a bigger collection, but, um, but man, I think there's a lot of genes we all play with that we still haven't really pinned them down and identified them and named them yet to margin stuff like that. So there's going to be a lot of those that are going to do crazy stuff with Lily and other things like that. It's exciting, man. What what uh what's your favorite like Lily White combos or what you're most excited uh, excited for with the Lily Whites? Probably my number one right now, just because I think it's going to have the most weird factor to it is going to be super empty lily. Yeah. I think <clears throat> the end game on that, what I'm picturing and what I'm picturing usually ends up happening. Now it could be three years or it could be 15, depending on how wonky it go, you know, the, the genes go or whatever. But no, what I'm thinking is like an all white lily or mostly white lily really loaded up with white. And then just that whatever base color they are just a stripe of that right down the middle it's almost like a reverse crested gecko at that point because yeah. they all used to be red yellow black body base and then white right down the middle and on top of the head well now look where we're going yeah we're gonna have them white down the sides white on their limbs white everywhere and then maybe a red back and a red head if we can empty that head out more with super soft or whatever yeah. Um, that, I mean, you're talking about a completely different looking gecko yeah, than what we're used to. And it's going to have way more white than a, a lily phantom. Phantom lily kills the coat or the white, which makes sense. We've all known phantom eats white, you know, it, it, right. it eats it really, more. yeah. And it just fades them away. Whereas like with, with empty, it's just kind of carving it out. Right. Um, and then hopefully Hopefully, and it'd be like you were saying, if empty is messing with the orange on the sides, um, even better for these lilies. It's just yeah. more, yeah, more room for white to do its thing. <clears throat> so for me, that, I mean, for, especially in my collection, that, that's probably my most exciting, but God, man, some of these other, these other genes, these newer genes that are out there, um, sable, uh, I, I think the fraps are super cool. Um, yeah. That's just a good example of like how Lily is going to do some pretty wild stuff. Man, I hate how they grow in my collection though. Really? We get, yeah, you know, it gets a little bit warmer in there. Um, yeah, I have a hard time keeping my babies as cool as I'd like. Um, but yeah, our lilies don't grow that well. And I've sold them to people as babies and they, you know, they'll be adults in a year or 18 months or whatever, like anything else. But man, in my shop, yeah, they're like, takes me almost two years to get them up to size. And then they're still not as big as I'd like. How many original ladies did you start off with? I got two from Hector and then I got, uh, that I bought. And then Anthony sent me two on loan. Yeah. Two males. The two I got from Hector are females and I got them set up. <clears throat> God, I forgot what I even put them on. Probably a super empty. I can't remember though. But um, yeah, I didn't get very many of them. But I, uh, I don't think it's. I think it's me. I don't think it's. I, I mean, I think it's Lily, but I think it's something specifically that we're doing. It's probably our temperatures, because yeah. I mean, my stuff grows fast. Like I can get them to fifty, sixty grams inside of well inside of two years. Yeah. Um, maybe bigger i mean some of them you've seen some of the stuff on like 70. yeah but um yeah i don't know man i don't know what it is i think it's probably temperature related um maybe whatever it is i gotta figure it out because that's too cool of a gene not to play with yeah, what do you think i said maybe it's uh incubation temperature i'm coming out about the same size yeah you is know that... what it could be because I am incubating those in the shop, not in my incubator room. And it is warmer. And the reason I did that is to get more males. Yeah. Well, you know, when I first got the Lily Whites, um, 
I was incubating a little bit warmer for that same reason to get try to get more males. Male. And a lot of my eggs were dying. A lot of the babies were coming out very weak and small. Tiny. So, yeah. So I just started, you know, I just incubated. Well, and that's that's exactly why I have an incubator room that stays like 70, 72 degrees because they do hatch too small. Yeah. Um, you know, I never even, that's kind of stupid of me that I never put that together before. Um because that makes perfect sense. If I'm hatching these lilies out in the big room where it's hotter, they're going to start smaller. Yeah. Although I don't, dude, I don't know. I mean, they really don't seem that small to me. The babies, I need to look at them closer and see what's going on. I know, um, I don't seem to be very male heavy on the, the ones I've had that are big enough. We've right got now. a lot of males. You do? Yeah. Lilies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got we we got it pretty down the middle, cause I incubate a little cooler, but I incubate you know seventy five, seventy six. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, seventy five, seventy six. I notice I haven't kept enough detailed data on male female ratios, but I know they take me considerably longer to grow out if I'm hatching them at 75 or 76. Like I've got a, not as, not to adult, but just a sellable size. Yeah. Um, but you probably are hatching other geckos too. I know my gargoyles, I got to keep a little warmer too. Yeah. If yeah, I keep, keep my gargoyles that cool, I'll have all females, literally. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have, we have a lot of gargoyles as well. Do you, how's your, I know you got your Dexter, you know, line and stuff. How, how many gargles do you guys have, and what are you focusing on that? Um, how many? Probably, man, I know the number. It's like, I think there was, up until last year, there were like, not even 100 groups, maybe 80. Oh. So okay. nothing, I mean, compared to the Cresteds. And then um, I added, though... Dude, I want to say I added 70 last year. Oh, wow. Um, so I do the Dexter ones, then I have all the, you know, the run of the mill. I say run of the mill, but they're all selectively bred. But like uh, a lot of the stuff that Alan had and then went to uh, gourmet. Um, so like the white, uh, black and white stripes, and then some of the red base, but like, Mine, I've been, you know, me, I'm, I got to play. I've been playing with some of those, mixing them up and stuff. And like the the kind of the burgundy or pinkish base color, you know, the pretty yes. common one. Um, I've been plugging that into the same whites that I used on the Dexter line. And I, I thought I was going to get white and pink. I did not. I got kind of a pastel pink mm. or white and yeah, that burgundy color. They're cool though. Like they'll have like burgundy stripe and then a pastel pink stripe. So that's a cool one that I've been playing with a little bit. But um, mainly, I'm just hammering on those Dexters, trying to get more males of those, trying to yeah, get um, as much red as I can in those two. Yeah, I've got big, big girls, like 70, 80, 90 gram females from that line. No male for them. And you got to be real careful rotating male gargoyles through female territory when they're yeah. not used to a male being in there. Yeah. Because that, 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 yeah, that one out of that one male I have that I'm trying to cover 10 females with, man, you're playing Russian roulette with that boy's life when you put him in there. Those <laughs> girls, a big, big girl like that, they get a hold of a male, they'll kill him. I mean, it's, yeah. it's bad news. Like, that's one thing I figured out. Last year, when I set all those gargoyles up, I tried to keep them under like 50 grams for not having like killers together. Cause man, they, it's like at some point they get so damn big, you got to keep them with, you got to have a big male. And that's like yeah. when I get females that are this far out in front of, you know, if I've got two year old females that I don't have a male for yet, they're going to be 100 grams by the time a male I produce is breedable. And I ain't put, you know, I'm not going to be able to put him on those. So it's kind of weird. I've got groups of those big, big girls. I don't really know what to do. I guess I could try rotating my bigger males through there, but that's just that. So, yeah, yeah they worry me, man. I need to probably need to bring those home and just watch them set them up. 
is there is yeah. there is there any other secret projects that you got going on that you haven't spoken about yet couple usually you know it's funny this is all i'm starting to see my own behavior kind of unfold and starting to identify little uh, patterns in my behavior. And one thing I figured out is most jeans I see that pop up in my collection, I hate them. I really? hate them at first. Oh, I never like them. But Pixel I didn't like. Soft scale I liked, but I didn't think was marketable. Um, we've got another one. And I'm not, I'm not even going to talk about like what it is or what it looks like or anything. But yeah. one thing I've noticed right now is that their noses come out just a little bit pointier than normal and I don't like it and that's the only thing different I've noticed other than they have some really jacked up like patterning on their crest especially like they're just totally whacked out like yeah. stuff's missing I've got one if I sent you a picture of him you would swear to me this gecko has MBD and his back's all jacked up like crooked yeah you run your fingers down his back there's nothing wrong with it it's just his pattern I'll send you a picture privately. I'll let you see what it looks like. But um, I've got that. I Right now, I mean, I'm looking at it. I can't imagine trying to make more of that. But who knows? You know what I'm saying? I might accidentally get one that looks really cool that'll change my mind. Or I might see it paired with right. something. Um, but right now, it's it's a wild Wait, thing. It's, you know? like it's wild in a good way. I was just thinking that. I was just thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> I would probably throw it in there with Lily and have something crazy come out that everybody would love. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, right now it's like it's the new punching bag. Like it, we don't like. I didn't like Pixel at all either. Like that was I was pretty pretty down on that one too until I saw the white walls. Um, I didn't like what I thought it was doing to the structure, which it's not. It was just the geckos it was coming out of weren't right for it. Yeah. But um. Yeah, this one, I you have to see it. It's messy. Like, the pattern's messy on it. It just really, they look deformed, and they're that, not. That's interesting. I can't wait to yeah. see it. Um, did, did anything ever come out, like, any weird trait or, or more come out of your Area 51 stuff back in the day? Oh, most every, I mean, like, a lot of this stuff... Um, like you see now we've got super empties in every color. That's only because of area 51 type stuff right. where we were putting and like on that one in particular, um, for empty back, what I was noticing was the pinning going all the way up to the ears or the head. Yeah. And that's all I, I had it labeled like for a three, a three character code on the cage. It said P2H, which is pinning to head is all that. Yeah. And that's all I was after. But I started noticing that stuff on a lot of them, even though it wasn't white pinning. I just noticed there was something there. I could see some lines in there, some patterning. So I knew it was there, but it was like they were kind of wasted, you know, because it was a waste of having that gene in there because you couldn't really see it with what else was going on, the creamy dorsal or whatever. Of course, the super changed my opinion there. But um, yeah, that's how all that happened is I had these pinning pin to head geckos that didn't like, it was kind of a bust. I didn't like how they came out. Didn't realize what the super would be. And, uh, yeah, I started plugging them into yellow stuff and red stuff. I'm like, I'm going to run the pinning up to the head in every color of gecko I have. Yeah. And it didn't quite play out like that. But then, yeah, we ended up with it and everything. Uh, but that's kind of area 51 type stuff where I'm mish kind of a mishmash. Um, usually it was dictated by not what I thought was a good idea, but by what I had that I didn't want to sell. It's too nice to sell it, but I couldn't pair it up correctly to make more like it. Yeah. And it was like, when I did that, I was like, well, I'll go ahead and pair these up with something that might not make sense. And we'll just do that until I get a male for these females or I get a female for this male or whatever that looks better. And I can swap them out later. Of course, I left it all together because I was afraid I was going to not produce some of the stuff that I liked that I was yeah. seeing. Uh, but yeah, that I really, I mean, if you've got the room to do stuff like that, I highly recommend it. That was a big advantage because some of that stuff, it would be years before I would find something useful that came of that. You know, you'd notice uh, trying to think of examples. Of, oh, like the, 
uh, bringing white walls and to phantoms and stuff. It was like, um, and the porthole ones. I mean, that was just yeah. mixing mixing stuff together that I wouldn't have normally done. Yeah. Um, just to be clear, so maybe some people that don't know what the Area Fifty One was was your groups of just like random, yeah. more mishmash together, and then you could just yeah. Stuff together. Yeah, stuff I couldn't pair up correctly, and it was like, yeah, I didn't want to sell them, but I didn't didn't want to not breed them, and so it was like, well pair them up, see what happens. But yeah, that actually did me a lot of good. Um, God, that was 2007 when I set that up, 2008. <laughs> so that like, yeah, that took a long time before I, I would say anything great really like came from that, took some generations, but yeah, it was totally worth it. I still do stuff like that. That's Not awesome. a lot, but I, I bet last year I set up 200 new groups. I probably had 20 like that that were mixed up colors or whatever. But these were a little bit more of an educated guess, you know, yeah. after seeing what happened before. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, man. Um, yeah, it's funny. There's You can do a lot uh, outcrossing like that. And then, of course, we all know you can do a lot by line breeding, too. You can stumble upon genes and things. Yeah, so it's good to have those outcrossed animals, though, that you can kind of later you can yeah. go breeding them back together to see what's going on with them. Yeah, that that's a good point, because I noticed like a lot of people that, you know, care so much about lineage and everything start to breed kind of like the same type of look together. And without mm -hmm. knowing that a lot of those animals trace back to the same, you know, like core parents. So oh, yeah. it's always, it's always good to to mix it up and, and throw a monkey wrench in there and then you might pop some cool stuff and at the very yeah. least you could not cross it and put it back in later on well i mean that was like how i learned um like our c2 stuff um that you can i mean you can plug those in with kind of whatever you want you're going to be getting geckos if you've got a c2 male um and all you have is a bunch of dark harlequin females you're fine you're going to get c2 looking males or not males c2 looking babies yeah. Uh, just with that male being there and you can you can kind of take that and run with it and of course you're going to get some characteristics of the females in there too but um, yeah I mean you can learn a lot like that by doing that kind of stuff um, what else there was something else I was going to mention with that I can't go ahead can't Anyways, what else I just well mentioned. Anthony we, we've gone on for almost two hours now I don't want to keep you up yeah but uh, before we, we end this stuff, I wanted to, you know, is there anything you want to plug in? I know, you know, you, you have your website, acreptiles.com. You have your Instagram, your Facebook. Was there anything yeah. else to plug in or, or mention? No. Um, oh, you know, I did tell uh, Dan I would mention, you know, Gecko Harmony. Did you know he yeah. has a brewery? Oh, I, I didn't even put this together. Yeah, let me go grab one. I told him I'd throw it up on there. Yeah, Foley Brothers. They're up in Vermont. Hold on. Nice. I got some in the fridge. Maybe oh. maybe I gotta when I go to Vermont, I gotta go check it out. Yeah. Hold on. Oh I should have had one instead of whiskey earlier. But yeah, uh no man, other than that, like my website, this is Nice. This is Gecko Harmony. This is one of his. Shout out to Gecko Harmony. His ales, yeah. But uh, no, other than that, man, like my website, my Instagram, uh, I'm pretty much anything on my Facebook is coming from my Instagram lately. I figured out that's just easier. Yeah. But I need. I want to start doing some videos soon. I'm hoping to do that. But let me let me yeah, know. Man. I you know I've told you whenever you want, I'll go. I'll fly out to you. We can make some videos. Whatever you want. Well, I am strongly like right now, uh, we're kind of, um, transitioning at a point. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out like facility wise, how I want to do it. If I want to open a second building, um, or if I want to do it all together, I think it's going to depend on what I find building wise. But, uh, part of that I want to do is a, uh, uh, big showroom basically like uh i want to have like at least 500 geckos on display at any given time maybe more maybe like a thousand um we probably start opening 
on weekends or maybe every other week. I don't know how we'll do it, but it would start off as kind of a a scheduled event type thing. And then I, I would try to transition to more of a being there, you know, four or five days a week kind of deal, more like a store. Yeah. Um, but cool. yeah, man. So we're kind of looking for, looking for space to do something like that right now. I've been talking about it for a couple of years and now it's kind of go time. I think, of course nice. this, this market hasn't made it real easy to, to jump sure. on that this year, but, um, but yeah, man, I mean, hopefully we'll be there, uh, getting that going sometime soon, but yeah, right now it's, huh. I'll be there at the grand opening. That's what I was going to say. If we do something like that, that would be super cool to come out. How often do you do videos for your, I know you're doing videos all the time now on Instagram. Yeah. How often do you, you do one, one a week or. Yeah, we, we try to put out one a week. So what day do you do it usually? Typically, it I, film on, typically I film on Fridays and I'll film like four videos. I got a guy that comes and films for me and edits the videos, but you know, things like this, I film myself. Uh, right. Typically, you know, we try to put out once a week at least. That's cool. Super yeah. cool. Yeah, man. Well, yeah, uh, once we figure out what we're doing, but yeah, right now I'm so jammed up. Everything's kind of like we actually wheel baby racks into the middle of the adult racks to like go through and feed them right now because we have like an extra 5,000 babies sitting there. I don't know about 5,000, yeah. probably like probably like three or four. But yeah, uh, yeah it's just kind of a mess. Yeah. Uh, I hear you. And we're, we're all... trying to trying to find another warehouse, uh, either another warehouse or commercial space, like a re uh, what do you call it? Retail. Yeah. So yeah, I'm on it. I'm trying to get yeah. that done. When you get, when you get that done. going, you we'll do a big video, ring and I'll be there. That'll be cool. Very cool. All right, man. Anthony, thank you so much, man. Like yeah, I said, yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Anytime, too. I'll do it again. Yeah, for sure. We, we got to do it again. It was a lot of fun. And the godfather of Crested Gecko Boys, <laughs> you got me into this, man. I Into the breeding, at least. So thank you so much for, cool. for coming on. And I appreciate your time, brother. Yeah, man. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks you, bro. again. All right, man. Um, See ya. All right.